I would like to be the person that uh, makes people think that technique is the most important overload and that every single time we approach the barbell, we want to lift with excellent technique. And I want to be the person that leaves the legacy of teaching athletes how to take care of their own bodies, of not pushing through pain, of learning how they can start addressing these aches and pains when they first come up because the no pain, no gain does not work out long term. So I want to be the person that allows athletes to, to lift injury free for a long time. We are now live uh, to the Mind Body Podcast. It's been a while since I've uh, did the podcast, so I'm really honored to have uh, the next guest to my podcast, uh, Dr. Aaron Horshig, uh, who is a doctor of physical therapy, a coach, the author of uh, Rebuilding Milo. Uh, so uh, welcome aboard, my friend. <laughs> Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, it's it's been uh, a long time since I did uh, the podcast. I used to to do it a lot. I interview many people uh, around the world, so uh, I'm really honored to have you as the first guest uh, since I think uh, 2021, since the Corona. The, the wow! Yeah. So. Well, I appreciate the uh, consideration to be the one to kick it back off again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're doing amazing work, first of all. So I really appreciate everything you do. Uh, with Squat University, uh, you teach a lot of people, including myself, uh, uh, how to really use our body more efficiently. So I would like to start uh, with, with yourself. How, how did you start uh, building, uh, like starting bodybuilding and like, you know, walking out and everything? What got you into it? Yeah, I mean, I got into it originally for training for football back in that sort of transition phase between middle school and high school. So entering ninth grade of high school, um, everyone in the football team uh, worked out together over the summertime and then got into it. Obviously, a lot of the weight room coaches were also the football coaches. So um, I was introduced to it at that time and just instantly fell in love with it. I was always one of those people that wanted to stay in the weight room the longest, you know, first one in, last one out kind of thing, just because I always enjoyed it so much. Um, even though I wasn't necessarily the most talented, the most strong, putting up the biggest numbers, I enjoyed the process of learning technique, trying to be as efficient as possible. And I guess you would say squeeze out every last ounce of talent uh, out of my body. So that was sort of where I fell in love with lifting originally. And then when I went to uh, my undergraduate degree, I went to college at Truman State University, just a small D2 school up in northeastern Missouri here in the United States. Um, I wanted to play baseball. That was always my goal uh, in college. And as it turned out, I ended up injuring my elbow during tryouts, which actually happened to be one of the best things ever because I didn't make the team. And the very next day, I found the Olympic weightlifting team at our university. Uh, at the time, this is back in 2005, Truman State was one of only a few universities in the entire United States that actually had an Olympic weightlifting team as a part of the university, as a club sport. So um, we had a really good coach, uh, Alex Cook, and um, just fell in love with it. I had never, I had seen Olympic weightlifting a little bit at that time. You have to remember back in 2005, uh, CrossFit was just in its infancy. So you weren't seeing Olympic lifts performed on TV in the United States much at all. You know, if you wanted to watch the Olympics, as far as the clean jerk and snatch competition, you'd have to stay up till three in the morning or watch it on like a, you know, CSNBC three or some weird station. You wouldn't see it ever on the main television channels during prime time ever, you know, it's reserved for the, the popular sports at the Olympics. So um, it was really my first introduction to competitive Olympic weightlifting back in 2005 and just went all in, really loved it. Uh, I competed in that sport for uh, 11 years before taking a step back from competing to concentrate a little bit more on my practice as a physical therapist and then also uh, doing a lot of stuff with Squat University, writing, producing content, things like that. Uh, but still to this day, I train um, for Olympic weightlifting. It's something that even though I, I don't compete anymore, I still enjoy training uh, a few days a week 
uh, in that aspect. So I, I work closely with Chad Vaughn, who puts out a lot of good content on social media, uh, on Instagram. His tag is the uh, only Chad, O-L-Y-C-H-A-D. Um, he went to the Olympics twice for the United States. So um, I'm constantly trying to f- refine my technique and, you know, improve my efficiency within the sport of weightlifting, even though I don't compete anymore. So that's really where everything started from was just, you know, getting into the gym as a young kid, falling in love with the process of, of learning strength training, everything that goes along with it. Uh, the ups and downs, just like anyone that's, you know, gone into the weight room and pushed heavy weights. I've had every single injury under the sun that most people also experience, you know, back pain that flares up during a heavy deadlift, knee pain that cripples your ability to perform a deep squat. You know, um, all of these things are, are different uh, pitfalls that I've experienced myself in my own training. So that's why one of the reasons why I decided to develop Squat University was sort of my outreach to the world to try to help people on their level, not talking down to you, but talking with you because I've been there many times myself as an athlete before I ever became a practitioner, someone that works with athletes. That's pretty amazing, man. Like, uh... The, the thing that you're saying that you did in, in that time frame, like 11 years, uh, that you started Squat University and you've been uh, competitive, uh, you know, you, you're lifting weights and, and everything. So to, to do all of this, uh, that must be really hard, you know. So um, I would like to ask you, like, did, did you start uh, Squat uni- University uh, while you were uh, doing this, those uh, uh, Olympic weightlifting? So I graduated with my doctorate in physical therapy in the spring of 2012 and then went to work out in Kansas City at a place at the time called Boost Physical Therapy and Sports Performance. And I probably, that's so it was spring 2012, I continued... Um, with my Olympic weightlifting uh, competitions until my last year was 2016. So I did still uh, train for four more years following graduation. And I started Squat University in the fall of 2015. So there was a little bit of overlap where not only was I seeing patients for about 40 to 50 hours a week, depending on how busy we were in clinic, but I was also training and pulling two days uh, with weightlifting to try to you know be as efficient as my as possible and then i was also writing my first book the squat bible creating content uh across social media so yeah it was it was a lot of that time and i also got married during that time frame so um yeah that's eventually certain things had to take a a back seat uh which is why I, i decided to step away from competing in olympic weightlifting around that time but so there was a little transition period where i was still doing a lot of weightlifting uh, while also trying to start Squat University and treat as a full-time clinician. What do you think is some of the biggest keys that uh, you can take from uh, lifting weights to, to life and as an entrepreneur that you start building your own business uh, that you see that you apply there? I would say the biggest thing is just taking your time and understanding that it's going to be a process to build whatever you're looking for, whether that's in weight training, uh, getting a bigger lift, whether that's in bodybuilding, trying to develop your body and grow muscles, whether you're trying to lose weight or whether you're trying to be an entrepreneur and grow business, you know, it doesn't, nothing happens overnight. There's, we're so enamored today in our, especially in our social media world with these quick fixes and, Mm -hmm. you know, six weeks to the perfect body or, you know, put a hundred pounds of your squat on eight weeks. And, you know, that I think while some people do see quick changes the, for the far majority of us, they're not sustainable if they do come that fast. Um, things, good things take time. Um, so I think I have found, especially in weightlifting, that the process of building amazing strength, improving lifts, it takes time and you need to set goals for yourself, but also be realistic in understanding that it's not going to be something that's going to come tomorrow, the next week, the next year, but it's a, enjoy the ride while you're doing it. Because, uh, you know, if you're always looking for tomorrow, you're going to skip the enjoyment of what you're building today. And I think long-term that adds up to, uh, to big changes long, long-term. 
the thing is that like uh, what you're saying is like most of us we, we know it logically but then like uh, you know just like when you start lifting weight okay so you you don't see the result that you you want to see uh, immediately even like two three months and then uh, like your motivation drops right and sometimes as an entrepreneur it happens as well like you have that extra motivation like okay i have this passion i want to share it with the world and you're doing and you bring in a lot of content and everything and then after a while like you see like okay i i see nothing maybe after a year two years three years and then sometimes you have lack of motivation and then your drive drops and yeah you like don't have that creativity anymore so how did you for example if you had those moments did you handle with yep. times oh gosh yeah i mean i'll give an example just uh a couple weeks ago um i had covid um and i i didn't get very sick from it i mean i i had a cold um i had a cough that lasted a week or two um but the the biggest thing that was tough was the brain fog and just not having the creativity there for literally like a, an entire week and it was really frustrating because I would set up my computer and go to make a post and just no gears were turning. There was nothing creativity wise in my brain. I would make, I would sit for four hours and maybe come up with something that looks okay as far as, you know, creative content. So um, it can be difficult at those times to get frustrated um, and want to just, you know, throw the computer away and take a step back. And um, I think the big thing to understand is, you know, no one builds a building in one day. And if you take a day off or a week off, the building that you built is still going to be there. So if there's a time where you have to take a step back as an entrepreneur from posting as frequently or making new content, you know, there's nothing wrong with just throwing up something that you've made last year, the year before, a couple months ago, reposting things or just maybe not posting as much that day or for a few days. When you're going to come back, you'll have that creativity come back again. Uh, that building that you've built will be there to take another step forward. So I think sometimes just taking a step back and doing things that allow you to clear your head and get back in that creative mindset uh, can be really helpful. Like, but what if you build the building and like you build it for years and years and a big, really big building and then yeah. all it takes is just like, you know, a few things that you do bad and all the building is gone now. So how you recreate a building? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's a tough situation. I think it depends on the person and uh, in what happens. I'll say this is that there's rarely a time where something would just completely dismantle, I would say. I mean, I'd have to have an example of what that would be. I would say a, a lot of times not all is not lost. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes we will all have, injuries for example um work with athletes and you're you're building you're building you're building and then an injury strikes back pain and you're just you feel like a shell of yourself you can't even put 50 percent of what you used to squat on the bar and your back just hurts you feel crippled you feel like there's no way you'll ever be the person you were before sometimes you have to take a step back in order to take three steps forward again and that can be the hardest thing as an athlete or just anyone who has a competitive drive, be that in sports or entrepreneurial spirit, is sometimes taking a step back to analyze where you're at, fix and address what needs to be addressed so that you can continue forward. Yeah. So whether that's an injury, uh -huh. whether that's a mishap in business, I think uh, it's the big thing is to understand that all is not lost uh, in times of, in a lot of times of tragedy, it's having that clear head that, you know, one day or one issue does not represent your entirety of who you are and what you've built. There's much more to come, you know, have patience kind of thing. You know, I think so often we think in the short term mindset of like, well, I have to do this at this time. And I've been there myself many times where I've jumped the gun and I've only been like, I have to do this. And if I don't do it right now, everything is lost or I'm not going to get to where I want. If I don't do ABC, I'm not going to get to the you know final results. And I think sometimes in uh, taking that step back and having perspective and understanding there's so many more opportunities that will come in the future. There's so much more uh, time that you think you don't have that you really do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. Like 
for me, I have that competitive drive and I, I really have a high standard when I walk out, like I, I push myself to really exhaustion and to the limit. And I know it's, it's not that good when you do it for a long period of time. Like my girlfriend all the time tell me like, you gotta take a deal out, you, you gotta, you know, uh, take mm-hmm. a step back a little bit. And it's so hard for me to do. Like it's literally in my mind, like, I can't do like 50% of what I u- used to do. Even if for mm-hmm. one woke up, I feel like, no, I, I can't do it. So, so yep. what you're t- saying, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard, but it's Thank something uh, that's a must in order to. And, and I think that's why I often will try to not just say it, but show examples of people who are elite athletes showing importance of things like that, mm-hmm. you know, talking to, for example, in the powerlifting world, Ed Cohen, who's considered to be one of the greatest powerlifters of all time in having him voice, you know, you need to deload. You need to be perfect with technique in lightweight and take your time and have days of, of light, you know, resistance training to balance out the heavy pushing. Um, you know, because I think that that helps a lot of athletes allow it to sink in because they're looking up to a lot of these athletes, which I know I'm not an elite athlete, but if I can feature a lot of these athletes in that I believe are going about things the right way, I think that can help create long-term changes. Cause yeah, like, like you said, if you have a day where you don't want to take a step back 50%, that seems like you're going to lose your progress. Right. Mm -hmm. And I understand that because I've been there myself. That's a competitive mindset that we all get as athletes, but understanding again, perspective in how, that 50% day actually fits very well within the entirety of a training program. And that understanding that recovery and having that small step back is actually the catapult that continues progress forward, I think is very important. Yeah. What I really love about you and the way you, you show in your videos is how calm you are as a person like you're really a good talker and it's really good to hear you and what i would like to ask you is what is some of daily habits that you have that keep your mind in a good place and how do you actually manage your time yeah i mean i would say um a couple habits that i feel keep me in the right mindset i am definitely someone that does i work out four days a week right now. That's my training schedule. So I used to work out a lot more. I mean, I would pull eight to 10 training sessions a week. Um, and I felt at the time that I needed that much in order to progress. Uh, so taking a step back actually was a fairly difficult thing for me again, along with the same mindset that you, uh, discussed, uh, but having those, those days of exercise to allow you to, to put your emphasis into something that is purposeful, to uh, having goals, I think allows me to clear my head. I sort of need those training sessions, but not as many as I thought I used to. I think that can be very helpful. Um, So some sort of daily fitness, even if it's not a a long workout, doing something, sitting in a deep squat, doing a little bit of mobility work, something to get your body up and moving, I think it'd be very helpful, especially uh, when you're trying to get those creative juices rolling. You know, sometimes those gears aren't turning for creating new content, sometimes just taking a step back from the computer and going and taking a walk. You know, I've got a dog that I try to take for a walk a few times a week uh, can be really helpful or even just going and, you know, watching a movie. You know, it's one thing that my wife and I like to do together is watch the movie, sort of take a step back. And sometimes all of a sudden things will just click into my head. Um, But as far as uh, my weekly routine, I treat patients five days a week right now for a total of 40 hours a week. So I'm still very much so in the clinic uh, working with patients. Um, yeah, I would say it's my routine is pretty simple and pretty, uh, you know, treat patients, exercise, come home, relax with my wife, you know, rinse, wash, do it again. Yeah. And, and, and uh, that's working for me, for you. So I can see that from like, you know, you, you keep posting and everything. And like, uh, as long as, uh, everything is on point and, uh, it doesn't affect your relationship with the wife. So, so it, it's great. Very, very important. I, all, I also wanted to ask you, like, um, 
if you have any uh, apps that you, because most of us, you know, you, we're using the phone, we use that. So what is maybe three to five apps that uh, you think uh, that is very helpful for you in, in your daily? Um, well, I, uh, I thought I heard your, your girlfriend mention the Calm app. You know, I've used that before, um, which is, um, you know, really good for meditation and things like that. So I have used that before. Um, besides that, I don't really think I have any apps that I use for productivity. I would say just a lot of the apps that I use are just the social media apps because I'm constantly engaged in creating content and messaging people back. So, um, I would say the, the most used apps on my phone would be Instagram, TikTok, uh, and Twitter, probably just on those all day long. Do you have like hours that you're like, okay, from four to four thirty, I'm on Instagram and that's it, and then you turn it off. Not necessarily. I would say um, what I usually try to do in the morning is when I'm eating breakfast and um, you know before I leave for work, I'll usually try to go through my Instagram direct messages and message a few people back every single morning, um, and then throughout the day while I'm treating patients, if I get a few minutes. Uh, to myself, I'll be just going through any of those three apps. Uh, again, creating content constantly, messaging people back. Um, so I don't necessarily have like set times for each, but it's almost uh, just a part of my daily habits going through, um, you know, all three of those apps and constantly engaging when I am at work. And then when I'm home after work, that's when it's time to usually put the phone away and uh, disengage for the day. That, that's amazing man like uh, the, the way you you're doing things and uh, the amount of people that uh, you actually got you know to follow you like just on instagram i saw you have more than a million point two uh so and uh, in uh, in the youtube you have like almost uh, half a million subscribers so that that's pretty amazing so thank you and it's also just because you have just an amazing content and people pro probably share it a lot and like you're really passionate about what you do. So keep doing thank you. amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a little bit of professional questions that I have. Uh, we have a few minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, since I started dating my girlfriend, I was exposed more to the, the barefoot lifestyle. I didn't know about it much. Yep. And uh, I wanted to know uh, what's your point, the importance of uh, training your feet huge you know it's something that i would say within the last four years has become the one of the most pivotal factors i believe in maintaining optimal technique and uh efficiency with lifting that i think most people do not talk about enough we assume that because these giant manufacturers like nike adidas uh reebok that because they produce shoes that look the best that they are automatically the best for our feet and i think that's one of the most uh outrageous fallacies that we have in the world today as far as clothing and how we apply it to our bodies uh most people have no idea that the shoes that they wear are adversely affecting and harming their feet um if you were to look at a, a baby's foot right after it's born the toes are the widest part of the entire foot complex and if you were to also, in the same sense, look at different populations across the world that do not wear shoes as a part of their culture, their feet remain the exact same manner. Their toes be, are the widest part of their entire foot. However, in um, most other places in the world where it's common to wear shoes, and especially in uh, you know more of the, the first world countries where, uh, again, shoes like Nikes, Adidas, things like that are very easy to get your hands on they are all extremely narrow tipped and what happens over time is the foot adapts to the foot struck to the shoe structure it becomes more narrow at the toes we see an increased incident in bunions plantar fasciitis hammer toes a lot of issues within the foot also when the toes are smashed in together it leads to the foot becoming more unstable. And the foot is the entire foundation for your entire body. So it leads to inefficiency within your technique, whether you're deadlifting, squatting, pressing, anytime you were weight bearing, uh, a narrow shoe uh, leads to a more unstable foot. So a, uh, there's a new movement that's been going on recently, a little, becoming a little bit more popular, um, of finding shoes that are closer to 
barefoot style, you know, um, allowing the foot to regain its natural function. Obviously, we can't walk around in a city or into a shopping market or a restaurant completely barefoot. Uh, there's also, you know, you want to be able to protect your foot. So there's a number of shoe manufacturers nowadays that are developing shoes that have uh, a flexible sole, a wide toe box, no heel to toe drop. And I think there is so much benefit to this. I've had uh, Dr. Ray McClanahan on my podcast twice uh, to talk about the dangers of most modern shoes. Um, and I've also tried to create a lot of content to just educate people as to why shoes like Nikes and Adidas, the way they're currently manufactured, are not helpful for the feet and actually doing much more harm than good. And what we can do to make better choices for our feet, not only for the health and longevity of our feet, but also for our performance. How long do you think it takes the, the foot to, to get to its natural uh... Uh, it, it depends. Uh, it depends on the person, how long their foot has been uh, in that way, how uh, their type of soft tissue pliability. Some people, their feet bounce back pretty quickly. Other people, it can take a matter of, you know, two, three, four years of, of wearing a wider toe box shoe. And even then, you can also use um, some different things to assist in that. For example, I wear correct toes often, which is just a foot to orthotic, a uh, small little rubber piece that you put that sort of spreads your toes out a little bit. Um, almost think about it like braces for your toes. I think that can be really helpful for realigning the foot back to its normal structure. And there is any daily exercises that you can do? I, I remember seeing a, a post mm -hmm. that you said like, if our feet uh, has a six pack, then most of us <laughs> 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 train them, right? Huh? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you can do different foot exercises, but really, it's pretty simple. Get out of your narrow toed shoes and move. You know, be barefoot more often. You can wear the correct toes to spread your toes out. But just being weight-bearing without the restrictive nature of a narrow toe box shoe alone can make dramatic changes long-term. I, I didn't know it. Like, uh, my amazing girlfriend just, like, she, she teach me a lot that I didn't know. Uh, so, like, the importance of your feet in, in the squad, that was just like you were saying, I, I, I was not aware of all of that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really a, a big thing. Uh, another question I had is how do you actually diagnose a client? Let's say a new client come to you. So what would be some basic stuff that you tend to look at when you diagnose it? Yeah, well, it really depends on, on the person and their type of injury. But I'll say I take as a, a general rule of thumb a, a movement-based approach, which is what most physiotherapists or physical therapists uh, most uh, should take a, a similar approach. That's sort of the, the general consensus among the profession. So if someone came to me for, let's say, a lower body issue, um, you almost have to be a detective to sort of determine what is the underlying cause, why is it there? So not just where are the symptoms, what hurts, because that's what most medical doctors do. Where does it hurt? They poke and prod around that area. They may take an X-ray or an MRI. As a physical therapist or physio, our goal is to determine why it started in the first place. So I will be looking at uh, maybe how they squat. I may ask them to hold some weight like a barbell and see how they move, see what movement compensations they may have. Then we do um, generic breakouts to understand mobility and stability testing, strength testing. Basically, the idea is trying to uncover what imbalances this person may have that may lead us to understand a little bit more about why that current area is symptomatic. So what other causes may be fitting into this that may or may not be a part of the original symptom complaint. And then from there, we're able to develop a protocol to address all those deficits and then rebuild someone's capacity back to doing what they love to do. That, that's amazing, man. Like uh, that just show how, professional you are <laughs> uh, so uh, with that uh, I, I know we are short on time so i would ask you the the final question i used to ask uh, all the people i interview is what would uh -huh. be the, the legacy you would like to live uh, here in this world i would like to be the person yeah i would like to be the person that uh, makes people think that technique is the most important overload and that every single time we approach the barbell we want to lift with excellent technique and i want to be the person that leaves the legacy of teaching athletes how to take care of their own bodies of not pushing through pain of learning how they can start 
addressing these aches and pains when they first come up because the no pain, no gain does not work out long-term. So I want to be the person that allows athletes to, to lift injury free for a long time. You share our, our Aaron and I can speak from myself and probably millions of other people around the world. So thank you so much again for the time that uh, you gave uh, us uh, here and uh, for the, this interview. So keep doing your work. You're doing an amazing job, Matt. Thank uh, you. And I hope to hear lots of uh, great things uh, yeah, from really you in the future. I really appreciate you. Really. Thank, yeah, thank you're you. Very, you're very welcome. Thank you. You're very welcome.